Hello, and welcome to the 23rd episode of Adam Alonzi's podcast. Tonight with me I have the CEO of BioViva, Liz Parrish. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as we enjoyed recording it. Three, two, one. Hello, Liz. Fantastic to have you on the show. You guys are doing some spectacular work. Thank you. We're a pretty passionate crew on our side. We're we're the innovators. Uh, I actually have a hard time uh, believing that we're one of the first companies coming forward to do something like this. It seemed like the, the absolute logical step. Yes, the FDA was turned off to gene therapy quite some time ago. And I was still very young. But you guys are bringing it back. Yeah, we are. Actually, a lot of companies right now are bringing it back, but we're bringing it back in a different way. So in 99, uh, one patient died of uh, gene therapy. Uh, so it pretty much shut down the whole industry. Uh, that's pretty unfortunate, actually. Um, I think that one person dying in comparison to uh, how many people die every year taking their uh, pharmaceutical drugs as, as indicated, um, then we would think that the whole industry would actually have been shut down a long time ago. So adverse drug effects uh, kill over 80,000 people a year in the United States, and many of these effects, again, are people taking their drugs as prescribed. And uh, so that 80,000 number is sort of uh, hidden behind uh, the ADE, the adverse drug effect uh, label, and uh, no one actually has to be accountable for that, whereas um, with gene therapy, one person person died in an industry, a very promising industry was shut down. Uh, the only benefit of that, I could say, is it gave me time to catch up with what was going on in the industry and come out and uh, start a company that would do some really innovative and fantastic things, uh, uh, you know, uh, right on time. So I think that we're ready to get going again. One of your therapies is for Alzheimer's, and you are taking a unique approach to the disease. This therapy is a telomerase-inducing uh, gene therapy, and uh, we are very hopeful that we can use it in uh, Alzheimer's patients and get some results. We hope to uh, back this gene therapy up and use it in patients that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's uh, at a younger and younger and earlier and earlier stages, but we'd like to prove it in a compassionate care scenario, uh, maybe looking at mid-stage Alzheimer's patients and see if we can reverse it. The, the basis of the therapy is that we actually go in and we target the microglia. So a lot of people will say, well, neurons are not di uh, dividing cells, so why would you be targeting the brain? But actually, uh, microglia are dividing cells. They're responsible for cleaning up the beta amyloids. They're sort of the housekeepers, and there's about 50 of them to every one neuron. So this is really exciting. So we think that if we can reverse... Uh, uh, the epigenetic uh, damage uh, done to these dividing cells that happen to us over time with aging, we can reverse that, make a youthful microglia, uh, that it would start to clean that up. There's a new paper out this year that actually points to uh, neurons that are transduced with uh, telomerase-inducing uh, genes that in fact they start to clean up tau as well. And so we're super hopeful. I know the root cause or causes of Alzheimer's are still debated, but if you guys can do this, that would be wonderful. Yeah, and so we don't have to worry too much about what uh, causes it. If we can actually get uh, some of the damage cleaned up, you know, we'll be getting on top of the issue. If this doesn't completely reverse and cure the disease, of course, then we'll try to hit it with something else. But what we think is that we really need to start now. Um, you know, these people are dying, and uh, and there just doesn't really seem to be a call to action on this. You know, we have pharmaceutical companies that are running for drugs uh, that will ameliorate 
tolerate uh, Alzheimer's that will do, you know, maybe incremental change, maybe slow the disease a little bit, but that just doesn't seem the, the right path to start. We've had these gene therapies that have been in research for 16 plus years. You know, we've reversed aging in animals. We've reversed aging in every human tissue with the gene therapy we want to move forward uh, with for Alzheimer's. Uh, I don't understand why these haven't been in humans. Uh, you know, you don't have to, you know, take 20 year olds uh, who are, are healthy for their age and, and jack them up with gene therapies. You can take people who are dying and see if in fact they work and they can pioneer a whole new medicine for the world. Yes, the current restrictions on experimenting with terminally ill patients are morally deplorable. Well, yeah, it is. I think that this is sort of a safeguard and, uh, uh, you know, a holding of the guard that doesn't really make sense with new medicine anymore. There's a great book. It's called um, The Cure is in the Code. And it's actually written by a guy who, who worked with the government for many years. And uh, it's fantastic. It basically says, you know, that uh, the FDA and, and the governmental structures are just not ready for this new medicine. And it's much like when the internet came in, there was no regulation. It just came in so fast that there was no stopping it. And uh, we hope that, you know, gene therapy is similar and, and that, of course, no one gets hurt. You know, that's why we've brought on medical doctors and, you know, we want to work at an FDA standard, but offshore where it doesn't cost us so much. So safety and efficacy and price shouldn't have to go hand in hand. And as a matter of fact, shoving, you know, thousands of people through uh, clinical trials uh, isn't really the right way to do it. You know, in the future, what we're going to be working with is an N equals one study. One patient, one therapy, does it work for them? We're going to get it up to a precision medicine uh, level where, in fact, uh, you know, we'll be looking at your genome before we treat you. But what BioViva is doing right now is we're starting with genes that you, that should actually have a benefit to everyone uh, that have some sort of, um, level of uh, age reversal and that target aging as the disease because if we can knock that out uh, then we can knock out a slew of what I consider symptoms Alzheimer's heart disease um, you know cancer nephropathies these are most of these are, are caused by aging cells so there is genetic engineering and genomic engineering and this is an important distinction because there are many genes involved in the aging process it is yeah so there there is and so we do gene therapy now which is you know the most basic and rudimentary we you know we add a gene but it is quite possible let's say for the telomerase inducer and that's not the only gene therapy we'll talk about but for that one that that one will actually bit have the biggest bang for the buck and i'll tell you why it's actually a cell regulator. It's a genome regulator. So it will, should go in just like it does in cell culture, just like it does in animals and actually turn off a myriad of genes and damage that happened over time. So this is, this is our big hope is that basically what it does is it turns off these things that turn on over time that, that are um, associated with aging. So a lot of people don't know that, you know, you have more genes turned on as you get older and then that unfurling you know, the unfurling of the genome then can actually uh, kind of go haywire, kind of like a spring coming out of your bed and you get things like cancer. And I imagine eventually you'll be researching ways to modulate gene expression. We hope so. What we, what we're doing now is with the, the telomerase, uh, inducing gene therapy, we'll see how much of, of that it shores up. Okay. And um, then we'll look at other things. So yeah, you know, there, there is the idea of taking repressors off of genes and a lot of people with telomerase induction, that's what they've tried to do is they've tried to take the repressor off of the, the H tert, uh, gene itself and get it to produce telomerase. The problem is, you know, I work with a lot of epigeneticists and no one has been able to specifically target one gene. When you take the repressor off of one, you often take it off of other ones. And that generally isn't a good idea. So what we'd like to do right now is kind of shore the whole thing up, make the most youthful gene by tightening up uh, those, those genes, turning them back off, having the genes turned on that you had on when you were young. And then with gene therapy, what we do is we just insert genes that then we might want to upregulate to 
make you stronger, faster, more visually accurate, you know, smarter. That sounds very fun. And there are a few people who have already received gene therapy and are faster, stronger, and smarter because of it. Yeah, so, so actually our medical doctor uh, took one of our gene therapies over five years ago now. Now it's coming up on six years. And, and he took it for physical enhancement. So we have a myostatin inhibitor. And um, this, is, this gene is actually a gene that you have upregulated when you're younger. And so it's why when you're younger, you have more muscle and it downregulates as you get older. You can upregulate it by doing a lot of exercise, uh, but not to the point of the gene therapy. Uh, so he, he took it uh, in order to be, uh, you know, a, a bit stronger. He was impressed by the research. He was a real pioneer. But then he found a whole bunch of health benefits uh, that went along with with taking it. And since then, uh, the research has opened and opened and opened and opened. And uh, it, it looks like this gene may, in fact, uh, help us reverse atherosclerotic plaques. And so we're after that. And um, it actually appears to block TGF beta one, which then enables uh, the potential for your stem cells to, to talk to the rest of your body. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, regenerate, have better regenerative capacities over time. And uh, we're really excited about this. There were a lot of people when I started uh, BioViva that asked me why we were going after this gene instead of uh, the GDF11 gene, but we couldn't see the benefits to GDF11, appeared to block neural growth and uh, nerve uh, regeneration. And, uh, and it turned out we were right. Uh, a paper came out, I believe, of Harvard uh, that essentially uh, beat down the, the GDF-11. And so uh, we're happy that so far we seem to be on the right trout. And what we're trying to do now is, you know, obviously raise some funds so that we can do some clinical trials offshore with these and get a number of patients and, and see if, in fact, that this specific gene therapy is reversing atherosclerotic plaques. Which would be, I mean, that's the biggest killer in the United States, over one third of the population. And I don't foresee those numbers going down, not anytime soon. Well, we hope they do. We hope they do because of the research we're doing. But with what we have now, no, they're not going to go down. You know, that, that's one of the, the things that I state uh, often. You know, you can go to uh, the government pages and see that this is, in fact, uh, a, a true fact. That, you know, the U.S. is 5% of the world's population. We take 75% of the world's prescriptions. And we have the shortest lifespans of every uh, industrialized country. You know, we're taking a lot of drugs. We're throwing a lot of drugs at these diseases, and they're not working. And, you know, it's time for everyone to stand up and say, you know, that's it. We're, we want to pioneer a new future. Yes, the side effects of statins and other commonly prescribed drugs are well documented. And I'm not sure why someone would take most of them unless their life depended on it. And frequently it doesn't. Yeah, side effects are, uh, you know, I mean, in a way, you know, we laugh, everything's a side effect. So a side effect of taking a gene therapy is reversal of atherosclerotic plaques. But we definitely think of uh, side effects as being all the bad things. And, and we should, uh, you know, we should, we should really look at what we're doing and what we're taking and, and how it affects our life. And, uh, and, uh, you know, demand better medicine. We, we, we are really standing on the brink of a massive change. And it really uh, comes down to a grassroots movement. It comes down to people understanding what the options are out there and, you know, demanding that they have the right to access and use those, those treatments. I imagine you could make a fortune with a myostatin inhibitor by just going to various gyms and selling them to the bras. As we know, the experimental pecking order is monkeys, bras, then rats, and maybe petri dishes, somewhere between all of those. But sarcopenia is very common among elderly people, and any therapy that could help with that would be a great boon to them. 
Yeah, so what we're going after is the sarcopenia and the atherosclerosis with, with the myostatin inhibitor. Uh, we know that you know people will have a big interest in um, enhancement in general. And from what we understand, we may not be the only uh, company that's offering this, but you can't find those other companies. You know, they, they wouldn't they wouldn't want to talk about it because they they may be moving uh, through different sectors uh, for for their financing. You know, we're we're trying to, of course, you know, stick with the, the disease states. But you know, I'm sure that there'll be a, a big interest all the way around. The interesting thing here, though, I can say is that there will be a big slur in where preventative medicine and enhancement comes through uh, in the future. And I do believe that we'll be giving these therapies younger and younger. You know, we'll you know a gene therapy now that might be uh, considered. Um, plausible for someone over 60, I certainly could see people, you know, 40, uh, taking these and ensuring that, you know, they're, they're beefed up, they're muscled up and they're doing great things. As a matter of fact, I could see people with things like, um, you know, diseases. These are actually considered diseases, even though aging isn't obesity, uh, taking a myostatin inhibitor because it, in fact, it should, uh, reverse, uh, obesity, uh, quite a bit, uh, increased muscle, uh, decreased fat is what we see with this gene therapy. So that's, that's fantastic. Uh, it may also work with uh, diabetes type two. So, you know, there could be many indications and there may, could be many reasons that people get these, uh, genes upregulated when they're younger. And we, we do actually, uh, perceive that that will be the future. But right now we have to work in sort of a compassionate care scenario while the, the rest of the world accepts that. I mean, we have uh, actual athletes that die on the field of heart, heart attacks who are in their 20s. So, you know, at what point isn't it, it the right thing to do? I guess we just have to wait and see. Public support and how public acceptance, I think, will have a lot to do with that. Something of particular interest to me because I did some work in the area this summer, is your choice of vector, which is safe, not oncogenic. It will not kill you or give you a rash. So it sounds pretty fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So uh, AAV is a fantastic viral vector. Uh, we're really excited about this. As a matter of fact, we're watching a lot of gene therapies go through clinical trials right now in the US and AAV is one of the, the big uh, vectors that they use. Uh, everyone can watch this. I actually suggest that people go on clinicaltrial.gov and see what's happening right here in the US. There are, you know, the in 99, there was a, a reaction to the vector that they used. Uh, the, the, the AAV vector doesn't have these type of, uh, issues. As a matter of fact, the worst thing we see is a fever. And the reason this is really bad is then your gene therapy isn't going to take. And that's generally only with AAV2. So, uh, there's about 80% of the population that's seen AAV2. So you need to use an immune suppressant with that one. Uh, the rest of them are synthetic and they just pretty much, uh, trick the body. You know, the body's never seen them. They're not something that the body is aware of. And, and wants to throw out great defenses against. We'll see in the future what happens if we use uh, these therapies more than once. Then we could have uh, an immune response. And that's what those are the things that we want to avoid. We want to avoid your body uh, overreacting. But it's great when they do uh, integrate into the chromosome. It's chromosome 19 into an area that doesn't cause cancer. It's looking really good. We're excited about that. I mean, hundreds of people are actually taking AAV gene therapies and have over the last year or two, and uh, they're not reporting any uh, negative incidences besides occasionally a fever, a mild fever. I'm glad to hear it. Unfortunately, I was under the impression that viral vectors needed to be replaced with more sophisticated nanoparticles, at least for certain organ systems. For example, the paper I collaborated on involved renal diseases. There are some new technologies uh, that will be coming in. There are different ways to get the genes in. Uh, we will look at all of them, of course. We want to look at both transient methods and permanent methods. 
And, you know, we're just going to see uh, who's got the, the best uh, delivery methods over time. Right now, AEV is uh, it's very promising and it's very permanent. And so for our gene therapies that we want a lifetime expression, uh, these are the ones we want to go with. Some people are pretty cautious. You know, they're like, well, I would do a gene therapy if it um, only lasted for, you know, a few months. And, uh, I, I mean, I, I can see where they're coming from. They, they don't want to take the commitment, but when you see the price of gene therapies, you know, you might, you might want something a little more permanent and, uh, and not all gene therapies are the same. There are genes that we would want to express for a short period of time. And there are ones that you would want a lifetime expression. I'm a bit of a survivalist. Uh, so, you know, the one, the genes that I know that I'll want, uh, uh upregulated for a lifetime, I'm certainly, uh, going to want permanently expressed for myself that's that's my permanent that's my my personal choice that is one way to save money on the other hand in the not too distant future they should be fairly routine and inexpensive i i that's what we're hoping for we we really want to get the costs down as a matter of fact uh we would like to see um these uh type of gene therapies when when they're proven when the the public feels comfortable with them uh disseminated for free like immunizations you know or at very low cost and what that takes is that takes a huge inif initiative that takes uh, you know companies or or governments who can scale up to a, a massive amount and and actually get them out to the public you know and i think that uh the the uh, world has nothing uh, but gain from this because if you can keep a youthful robust healthy population then you have saved money you know in it's estimated in one presidential term one four-year term you know the the u.s government could save five to eight trillion dollars if we didn't have uh, these diseases of old age and that's something alex zavaronkov talks about in his book that there is a coming economic crisis if we do nothing to delay the effects or reverse the effects of aging. The silver tsunami is here. It's already here in the U.S. It's it's in Europe. It's certainly in Japan. Uh, by the year 2020, the whole world, okay, so as lifespan increases, fertility rates go down, and it doesn't matter what the religion, what the culture is, as lifespan ex increases, fertility rates go down. Uh, so for the whole world, so this is every country accounted for, by 2020, we'll have more people over the age of 65 than the five and under set. The five and under set go on to be the workforce as the 65s turn into 75s and 85s. And really, we can't afford uh, to not have a robust population at this point. These people may go on to live to 120. So, uh, well, we hope to, they, they'll actually live longer than that, but we can talk about that later. But if you live to 120 and you retire at 60, how are you going to survive? Who's going to pay for that? We have no safety net for this. You know, we're, we're in a rush to, to save our own hides at this point. It's projected that at this rate, without uh, new uh, medicine, by 2050, 35% of the GDP in the United States will be spent on health care alone. That's huge. That, that, I mean, there's no more, you know, where's clean water in public schools at that point? We don't know. Well, hopefully the cost of production will continue to drop, so we will live in a close-to-zero-cost society, but we should not depend on that. Yeah, well, right now, that, that's the thing, that this, this cost and this change... Uh, depend on new medicines. They depend on new innovations. They depend on new companies coming in with new ideas. Because the way things are running right now, you know, if you don't have insurance and, you know, your best bet are statins, or let's say you have diabetes and it's insulin and, or let's say you've got, uh, you know, a thyroid problem and it's, it's hormones, you know, how are you going to pay for it? You know, there, there is no model for this change right now in, uh, regular uh, in the way business runs today. We have to change that. We have to change that drastically. 
But from the bottom up, not from the top down. That's no, it's not going to come from the top down because nobody wants to be out of work. Nobody wants to make less next year. That's, that's just, you know, human nature. You know, no one's going to cut their, their own wage out. What we need is uh, new innovative strategies that, that, that change it at, at the core. It's got to be the people who demand it. And it shall be done through human action, not through human design. Now we're invoking the spirit of Hayek. <laughs> Very good. I love that. Yes. Let's do it. Say on. Creative destruction. <laughs> Eris. <Sean> Peter. <laughs> I believe Eris was the is the goddess of chaos and, and she can create order, so so perhaps we can <laughs> Well, you must destroy in order to create. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it really is, it's the truth, and it happens in everyone's lives on a, on a daily basis. Uh, you know, our, all our, our uh, perceptions change every day, and we have to tear something down and rebuild something else, or else we're living in a fantasy land where we're denying ourselves the truth. And so I think that it, it is a hallmark of uh, creators uh, to, to destroy. And as a matter of fact... I imagine this is why some of the, the most intelligent people in the world are also some of the most depressed. <laughs> and it may be uh, both that they see that you can never get uh, comfortable on, on a common ground, and it also may be that they see uh, so many people, you know, living the fantasy that somebody else is going to fix their problems. You know, we actually all have to get up and do something. Uh, you, I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. People have to learn about something new. They've got to do something uncomfortable. They've got to learn about, in this case, what death is, how that comes to you, how no one's going to solve that unless, you know, you get behind uh, new ideas. And uh, then, then things can change actually quite rapidly. This is something I've said before, but it's worth repeating. Now anyone can be involved in biology, in big data, in bioinformatics. All you need is a PC. Oh yeah, you you just you you can just get right in there and you can start doing it. And as a matter of fact, just so that people really see the entry level on this, you know, as far as gene therapy goes, it's it's relatively a uh, new field. I mean, it goes back to things that we've been doing for eons, but uh, it, it's something that you could get into. You can put several months work into, and you can understand uh, and keep up with the research that's going going on right now that the brightest minds are doing. You can be part of that. You can help move that forward. We have a couple people who intern for uh, BioViva, and they are not biologists, and they have spent a couple of years uh, studying hard, reading everything, and they are so uh, powerful. They are, they are such huge advocates uh, to what is going on. You really don't need to go in there and do things uh, uh, a, a specific way to learn something. What you need to do is you need to put your time into it. You need to wrap your mind around it, and you need to uh, be part of the research, be part of the solution. And yeah, there's a lot of do-it-yourself labs that are going on now. They're fantastic. I love what they're doing. I could not have said it better myself, which leads us to a question. How did you get involved with all of this stuff? Okay, so I did have some biology background, but I had really gotten away from that. I'm up in the uh, Pacific Northwest, and uh, I got into tech industries, and uh, we had a couple companies. We had a company called Rogue Sheep, and now Three Circles, and one called Aged and Distilled that are software, software companies. And uh, I was, I, I believe I was traveling in the Netherlands, and I ran into a guy who was interested in uh, stem cell uh, biology, and he wanted uh, this for medicinal purposes and had a lot of money and wanted to invest. I was in an industry that was heavily invested in, the, the tech industry. And so I started to go back and look at what was happening uh, in stem cell work. 
I got pretty involved. I was trying to help him find a place to put his money. I ended up starting a company, a nonprofit called Stem Cell Voice with another guy. It didn't really fly. Uh, the industry was part and parceled out. But what we did do a good job at was starting to teach people some uh, basic preliminary understanding of stem cell use that in fact, you know, embryonic stem cells are not fetuses. And that the most of the work uh, done in stem cell industry was autologous stem cells, you know, your own stem cells for your own body. And um, I started to think about uh, genetics and uh, how much more powerful uh, they were. It had always been my love and my interest. And then um, my family and friends, uh, ironically, almost at the same time, uh, were hit with uh, several children getting childhood diseases. And this is just ironic. We had a Crohn's disease. We had a diabetes type 1. We had a, a heart disease uh, scenario where uh, that child was lost. And I spent a lot of time in children's hospital uh, during that time. And I, I just, I saw all of these kids that, you know, needed assistance and they needed uh, a cure. And uh, I asked at the hospital, you know, what they were doing with stem cells and works in genetics and they weren't doing anything there. And this was children's hospital. And I was kind of like, wow, uh, you're not doing anything in this area. Well, not for those diseases. They weren't at that time. And I said, well, I'm, I'm just going to keep looking. I, I'm going to, I think I'm going to uh, hit the road of genetics because I think that therein will lie the cures for these diseases. And I ended up at a SENS conference <laughs> in the UK. And anyway, long story short, this is quite boring. I know. Uh, I was sitting uh, at the SENS conference. As a matter of fact, I think I bought the ticket about five days before the conference and I bought a flight because I was still wasn't sure I was going about two days before. And I flew out there and I sat through it and I thought, longevity, why are you know, why are we trying to live so long on this other end when we've got kids who are dying? And then it clicked and it hit me that this is what we would do. That, you know, we would in fact take all of these people who are dying of aging, cure that and then take these cures back to kids that we, you know, we had always done things in the young model. We always see and send young people off to war. We send young people to do this. We send young people to do that. Well, why not send the old people? See what we can do for the kids. Cause I think that therein lies the cure. You know, we have over a hundred thousand people dying a day of aging. You know, these, these are, these are great test subjects and it's not inhumane testing. This is actually testing to save their lives. And then I started to see the benefit, the economics, how, you know, we would have so much more for childhood disease economically, money wise, if we could wipe out these diseases of aging. And then I started to see the, 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 you know, the benefit of having people around for a really long time and how we could potentially change molds in all sorts of things we do politically worldwide we could change ideals if we lived long enough that the same patterns didn't take so long to set in that we that we resisted staying on the same path that we have for so long when history apparently happens so slowly we keep repeating the same mistakes you know, we keep putting the same type of people into government. We, you know, we refuse to change uh, big ideas because we don't have enough time in our life to see the patterns and to really learn everything that we need to learn to ensure that we don't keep making the same mistakes. I mean, on one hand, history, if you look at it, we're moving really fast. We're, we're incredible. You know, in 1900, there were 8,000 motor vehicle vehicles on the road. By 1920, there's 8 million. You know, now we've got the microwave, we've got the cell phone, we've got all this technology. We're working really fast. But, you know, for, for a lot of us, I think for you and for me, we're never working fast enough. <laughs> you know, we need to, we need to see these changes. And there's a huge value in the old that I had never realized before, you know, all of the historical perspective that they have.
and what they have, how they can change, you know, what we do in the future if they have, you know, their minds and their abilities and their, their strength. We'd really have an amazing society. History, Stephen said, is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. Oh, that's beautiful. James Joyce, um, possibly the only coherent part of that whole book, all 700 <laughs> pages of it. <laughs> I've tried to read it twice. <laughs> I managed to read the entire book. Fortunately, my Latin is decent, and most of it in there is fairly elementary, so I spit on him. <laughs> and move forward. Put it, put it in history, and yes, we are trying to wake up from it. We are, we are constantly trying to wake up from it. A, there was, there's been a lot of people that I know that are close to me, and they were like, well, Liz, until re recently, I really didn't even know what you were doing. And I said, yeah, just sleep just sleep. You know, those of us who have woken up, let us do the hard work now so we don't wake you up to a reality that you may not be able to have. Let us find out. You know, I've often said that, you know, life it can be, uh, for the most people, a, a real sleepwalk. But now I'm ready to jostle people awake and say, this could be your future. We think we're there. This could be your future. You have to demand it. And what we want to find out right now is with what we've got, can we do this? And if not, we need to know now. If we're wrong, if this isn't going to be the fix all, because we're not saying that it is, but it could be, if we're wrong, we need to know now. We need people to step up. We need people to, you know, help fund it. We need people to help try it. And we need to know if we've got it or not so that we can look for what we're missing. There, there is no time like the right now. You know, this is this is it. We we cannot afford another fifty million dollar mouse study to find out if people can live longer. There are too many people that need these therapies right now. We we can't afford that. That that's just the wrong way of doing things. It is tempting to use the red pill analogy. However, I have never seen those movies and it has been appropriated by every nutcase on the planet. So how about Kant's dogmatic slumber? We have to wake up and realize that scarcity, death, and aging are no longer necessities. They can be defeated. Oh, absolutely. I think that... It's true. One of our biggest uh, battles is to break down what people think is normal. So when, you know, when I say, well, we're trying to cure heart disease and Alzheimer's, we're trying to cure aging as a disease. We don't want you to die of what you consider the diseases of aging, what we would call symptoms. And they say, but that's the normal way to die. Why, why would you do it any other way? That's normal. And, you know, actually the normal way to die for humans is before the age of 30 of infectious disease. And that's how we die. We die before the age of 30 of infectious disease until the advent of antibiotics and immunizations. Okay. So there's your, you have already been on a slew of interventions uh, to extend your life. Workplace safety and sanitation came right alongside that. And we saw the biggest uh, burst in health span that we had seen uh, ever in the history of man. You can go back as far as you want uh, back uh, previous to that, and uh, you will see that most people die before the age of 30. There is always the outlier that died of aging back then, and that was considered absolutely abnormal. And it was actually considered a curse. You know, if you look back at old literature, it was considered a curse to die of old age because it was so deterior deteriorating to your body and your mind and your function, right? So normal has been thrown out a long time ago. What's normal is for science to come up and solve the next problems. And so this is actually the most sensical, logical step is to now try to obliterate the next roadblock, and those are the diseases or symptoms of aging. Well, my listeners are used to my zigzag style of interviewing. 
I saw something called PRCN829, 729? 829, on your website. Yeah, that's, a, we actually have a patent. Yeah, <laughs> as, as forward thinking of a company we are, we actually have a patent. So uh, it, this is a, a, a gene therapy that we're really excited about. And this one does need some research. Uh, it, needs some, it needs some background work done on it. And we are applying for a couple grants to hopefully uh, be able to do that. So I'm going to tell you what that's based on. And I hope that I make this clear. Uh, so uh, our main doctor, uh, he used to work with patients with ALS. He didn't really mean to, but he played football for years. And then he had one of the coaches had ALS and came to him for some help. And the guy said, well, you know, can you do this stem cell work on me? And Jason said, well, I actually don't do stem cell work. And they said, well, if we could bring you the research and show it to you, would you help us out? And he said, well, okay, I would. So uh, he basically treated this uh, patient with uh, stem cells uh, to the brain. And the patient had a myriad of benefits. They had what appeared to be reversal of the symptoms of ALS temporarily. It, it had been hoped that it would be permanent. The reversal of many of the effects of the disease happened very quickly within a few days, which really can't be attributed to the regrowth of, of cells or anything like that. And uh, Jason had a hard time grappling with why they had seen the benefits that they had seen. He ended up treating several other patients uh, the same way. Uh, the, the first patient, basically their family wrote an article that went into the newspaper. And then a lot of people started coming to Dr. Williams, uh, Jason, uh, to get the treatment. And he said, well, we, we're really not certain why this is happening, but we can try to re repeat it. And as a matter of fact, every time he did the therapy, it repeated. There were almost instantaneous results that then would subside over time. He started going through a bunch of research papers to try to figure out why this was happening. He happened along some papers that had talked about uh, proteins that were sig that were sent out from stem cells. So you have to picture a stem cell. Its job is to heal an area. You've just torn these cells out of maybe the stomach or the thigh, and you've injected them into another area of the body. If you track them, they actually almost all of them leave the area. But what they do while they're in there is they signal. They're screaming. They're screaming damage. And what that signaling does is it wakes up the cells around them, cells that don't realize that there's damage because maybe they've gone uh, senescent. Maybe they're uh, cells that have too much damage. Maybe they're just cells that don't signal. They're daughter cells, and they're, they're not good at, at doing that. Well, these stem cells go in, and they start signaling, and all the cells around them start talking. There's a conversation to start healing the area. Okay. These reactions happen actually rather quickly. Well, he was like, well, it must be one of these signaling factors. Then he had a patient, I don't know, uh, five or eight patients in that said that they had a lot of pain after the injection and they wanted to use, uh, I think it was Advil. They wanted to use uh, ibuprofen to uh, take care of the pain. And so our doctor said, yeah, go ahead and take some ibuprofen. It was right after the procedure. It was the only patient that complained about the pain and wanted medicine. The patient didn't have any benefit. There was no benefit. It was the only outlier to the benefit. So he went back and he started reading through the papers. And it turns out that uh, this gene therapy that we have, uh, it, it comes down to H factor. There's a, a a factor called H factor. It's a protein. It's sent out. It signals to other cells to start repairing, wake up, wake up, repair. If you take ibuprofen, it actually blocks it. So there's a, there's a complement immune system. And we believe that this is what's responsible for ALS, macular degeneration, arthritis, Parkinson's potentially. What H factor does is it removes the complement immune system from, from the, uh, the cells that it's uh, invaded and sort of started to almost uh, put a coating onto. 
and the H factor goes in and it removes it and it tells the cells, remove it, you know, start repairing damage. So we're really excited about this. We are excited to find out if this gene therapy in ALS patients and Parkinson's patients first wouldn't in fact uh, be a cure in a sense uh, to their disease while we start to work on genomic engineering and work at the core of what's going on in the genome, which is, you know, that's a, that's a third tier uh, kind of stage uh, therapies that we're, we're not capable to do. Uh, we're not, uh, it's not something that we can do right now. So in this case, what we would do is we would inject to the brain, uh, this gene therapy, then it would emit the H factor regularly, continuously, and hopefully put these patients into a state of what would seem a curative remission. That's a long ways around that. I don't know if you want to use that because that's, that's a very long story, but it's a very important story. I have faith in the people who tune into my podcast. <laughs> they can wrap their mind around that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a long ways to go about saying that we have a gene therapy that may in fact signal a protein to the brain that will uh, remiss, you know, ALS and, and Parkinson's. It's a very, a very long that's way. That's much more succinct. <laughs> at least you've summarized it again. So. Is there something else you need or want to talk about? I think it may be, uh, I don't know if I can say this succinctly, but uh, probably one really good thing to bring up, uh, one good thing to talk about is gene therapy in general and, and what that means. Uh, so, you know, we take a gene a normal human gene and put it into your cells. What genes do is genes create proteins and proteins create you. They create everything about you. So they're your hormones, they're your cell structure, they're what you look like, they're uh, generally what you feel like unless you've altered yourself. <laughs> so what we do is we put in a gene that creates a protein that therefore changes you somehow. And that's really how simple and elegant it is. And that's important for people to know because a lot of people think that this is very complicated. When you have to go build a therapy, uh, that is complicated. But the idea of gene therapy and how it actually works is very simple. You know, it's not... Uh, this small molecule approach of, you know, throwing drugs into your body, metabolizing them through your liver and every other organ that you don't even intend to hit to get a side effect in some cells to do something. You know, we actually target specific cells. We put in a gene. It creates the protein. It's really clean. It's really elegant. Um, you know, people who are into natural me natural medicine they're into holistic medicine love it and you know i've been uh really happy to see that even the most religious people that i've talked to love the idea of it so i think that's important for people to know how how simple it is and so it's not a lot of waste it's not a lot of pollution it's not a lot of toxic runoff this is actually a really clean elegant way to do medicine <laughs> 